Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our panel, Detroit, as a hub for radical innovation. I'd like to thank the Detroit community for hosting this wonderful event. Uh, I mean, I've spoken with a number of, of representatives from that community, and they're all quite excited and, and, and quite engaged in seeing how we can make a radical, ex radical exchange successful, and particularly how we can help integrate with local communities around the world and implement these changes that we all care deeply about. And I'm, I'm really excited for this panel because we've put together a group of representatives from different aspects of the Detroit community who all bring their unique perspectives and unique understandings uh, to how Detroit has been incubating new sets of ideas that, that can help Detroit grow and help teach the the rest of the country uh, these um, what 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 implementing some of these ideas look like in practice. And so, with that, I'd like to welcome the panel to the stage. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Fayru Saad, and my, um, my connection to all of this is that um, previous to my current role, I currently work for the governor of Michigan. I served as Detroit's first director of immigrant affairs. And so um, we were looking at the kind of nexus of um, immigration, uh, immigrant integration, and um, how really we can work with the immigrant community at large, both locally and nationally, to really help Detroit grow, um, to help immigrants uh, put them on pathways to economic prosperity, and, and really to promote Detroit as a welcoming city, as we say, as a, a place that is open to people from um, everywhere and anywhere around the world, from refugees to um, more high-skilled immigrants in other places. And so um, I will be your moderator for today. Um, and so um, my jobs are to, is to kind of help get the discussion going and keep time to, to make sure we, we stay on time this morning. And so um, I'm uh, gonna start by kind of letting our panelists introduce themselves. Um, we have um, Jonathan Wee on my right, Ingrid, Ingrid Lafleur um, in the middle, and then Jerry. Oh, I forgot your last name. Sorry, Pappendorf, <laughs> you, you, oh, Pappendorf at the <laughs> at at the end. So um, I'm gonna pass the mic off to them, and um, two minutes each, guys. Thanks, Firuz. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jonathan Hui. Uh, I'm a program officer with the Kresge Foundation's Detroit program. Um, and I um, started my, my career here in Detroit as a high school civics teacher um, and um, kind of worked in the intersection uh, through my role at, uh, at a high school in the intersection of education and community development and thinking about the role of schools um, in uh, public spaces and how we integrate schools in kind of rooted in um, specific geographies and specific neighborhoods here in the city. Um, and just a, a kind of a brief background on, on the work that, that Kresge does in Detroit specifically. Um, we are a national foundation uh, that does grant making in American cities. Um, within the city of Detroit, uh, we focus on a few areas and really thinking about how, again, we're working across disciplines to land in place. We support our arts and culture ecosystem, early childhood, and community development. And cutting across all of those is um, a um, in intentionality around building the capacity of leaders and organizations to execute that work um, and a focus on um, thinking about racial equity and how um, the disinvestment and investment uh, based on race in our city has contributed to um, the systems that exist in each of those three places and how we can kind of work to address uh, some of those root causes. So just a, a, a brief introduction and kind of about uh, myself and our work and just really looking forward to our conversation today. Hi, my name is Ingrid LaFleur. 
I am a curator. I focus on Afrofuturism. I am a pleasure activist, uh, sometimes an artist. And I am currently uh, the chief community officer for EOS Detroit. EOS Detroit is a block producer for uh, EOS and uh, two sister chains. Uh, and that is a blockchain company. And it's a little complicated if you don't know about it, <laughs> but I am the person who actually teaches people about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. Uh, I have this really wonderful role of really looking at what it means to introduce emerging tech into communities of color here in Detroit specifically. Um, and we are working on a project uh, to really support community initiatives, especially cooperatives or cooperative-like um, organizations. Um, and I'll probably get more into that uh, later. Thank you for having me. Thanks, my name is Jerry Paffendorf, which Paffendorf, much like me, looks complicated, but is rather simple. So there we go, it's one of the, the Harry Potter names. Um, so I, I moved to Detroit about 10 years ago, 2009, um, co-founder and CEO of a property mapping and data company called Loveland Technologies. We run a website at landgrid.com where we've collected nationwide information about property shapes, ownership, land use, um, no matter where you're in from out of town, you could go to that site and look up who owns everything in your city, everything in your neighborhood. And there's some mapping tools that go alongside of that, an app to go out and do property surveys, and easy ways to color code and sift through uh, land use information to get insights about who owns things in your area, how land is taxed, zoned, really how we use and inhabit the space of the earth. And the reason we do that work is really entirely because of Detroit. So, you know, I was thinking about the the topic of this and radical innovation in Detroit. I wanna talk about other people besides myself and ourselves, but I will share that this city has so many influences that will force you to learn from it and address them. It was difficult for us as a tech company to just be a tech company in the city and then work elsewhere. There are so many interesting things and needs in Detroit that it sort of demands that you pay attention to them. And one of the things that demanded our attention is that the underlying issue of who owns the land in Detroit, who is at risk of foreclosure, where are there buildings that need to be repurposed or taken down, how do communities control their land or not, who is being gentrified by outside investment coming in when people aren't even aware that that's happening. We recognize that there was a real need to map the city at that granular parcel level and then make that information public to share with people. And that's really taken us on a voyage where we inter interface with community groups, block clubs, activists, government, and business, all of which has kind of added up to a really heady Detroit innovation experience. Great. Oop. Just, just beat it. Just beat it. <laughs> um, so we thought um, we'd start off the discussion by um, you know, looking at this question of why Detroit. I'm sure um, that's probably why a lot of you are here. Um, for, for myself, um, I was born and raised in the Detroit area. Um, my parents are immigrants and um, they came here, uh, they came to Detroit in the mid seventies and opened up a, a meat market actually in Detroit's Eastern market. Um, uh, the irony of my life is that I'm a vegetarian um, but nevertheless, meat has been the, the provider of our household. And so um, what brought me to Detroit was really being able um, to kind of give the city back what I felt like my parents benefited from. Um, and so I'm going to pose that all to you. Why Detroit? What brought you here? Why are you staying? Why is this a place to, to, to grow? Mm -hmm. Who wants to start? Start at the end, maybe start with you. I guess, I, yeah, I guess start. I can start because I'm I'm like a, at this point kind of like a newbie old bee like in a sense you know what I mean I figure if you know I've been been in town for a decade now it's been a very interesting decade and I think in 2009 when I came to the city it was still very much at a period when most of the people that I met were like why like why or like what are you trying to do what are you trying to do to us why are you here what's wrong with you <laughs> this is kind of like the penguin running in the opposite direction. Um, <laughs> and I, a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not even exaggerating that much. I think for kind of the mood that I that I felt. And I, I had been previously in New York for a few years and in, in San Francisco um, working on internet startup stuff. 
and just had this general mood that was like, if the network is supposed to connect people everywhere, and if you're really supposed to be creative with it, why are things so con constrained in those two areas where if you want to start something, you got to go find a venture capital investment. They're going to want to put two zeros behind the, the valuation of whatever you do. Everything follows these trends of, at the time, it's just social this, social that. And it was just kind of, my brain kind of was overflowing, thinking like there have to be other places with different influences where you can do internet things and that will help you learn and arrive at new ideas. And so that's really what brought me to the city. And, and um, boy, I didn't know what to expect, but um, I'm so happy that I did because the last 10 years, I think, really shook me to wake me up in the sense that I think I would have told you that I knew, I know how cities work. You know, I kind of know what people do to be successful with, with businesses, I think, even though I'd never really been successful with it. And, and, and that's, that's kind of the attitude you get, I think, in those places where you need to be louder but not necessarily know what you're, what you're talking about. Um, and so Detroit really brought things down to earth because, um, you know, I want to pass the mic and not talk too long, but the things, things that you hit when you're in a city that has had 2 million people and has a third of that population right now that has major racial issues in how Detroit is an 80% African-American city gets along with the suburbs and the rest of the state, which are the, basically the inverse of that and all the historic trauma that comes along with the city that's been disinvested and not supported by its neighbors. You get down to earth with your highfalutin tech ideas real fast. You know, and you, you start hanging out with people who, um, well, that's, 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 what, that's, that's what got me here. And that was, that, that was the exciting part that I think keeps me here is that it, it's helped make me and our team a more holistic tech and data builder. Um, and so when I watch the conversations happening right now where tech seems detached from what's going on in the real world, I'm not going to say we're perfect at it, but Detroit has given me an amazing training and a network to be like, oh, I know not to make any of those mistakes now and, and feel that genuinely, not just to not want to get in trouble, but to realize we can't provide value to people if we're not dealing with people on the terms of where they are and listening. So that's, that's what got me here and that's what's made me stay. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. Uh, I think a lot of people could um, <clears throat> stand to hear that <laughs> in this conference. But I, I think that also... Sorry, that wasn't a tech. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, there's so much to learn from Detroit, and that's the reason why I came back home. I'm a born and raised Detroiter. Um, I was born in the 70s, so I experienced a very different Detroit than what you're, you're experiencing. It was 99.9% .9 black. I call it the golden era. It was not perfect, but it was beautifully black. And I felt safe. Um, I was able to experiment and grow without thinking about my blackness. And that's a, a privilege, I think, quite honestly, as a person of color in this nation. Uh, I came back home because I had lived already in the village in New York and Atlanta and Pittsburgh and these cities that had already gone through the transformation. So I kind of came after the fact. Um, and so I knew what happened after the fact, but I kind of was curious what would happen during. What is, a, what is that look like on the ground every day? Um, and then also Detroit is my home. Uh, it's majority black. It's one of the main reasons why I'm still in this country. I, I love living in majority black or of color um, cities. I feel safer there. Uh, and, and then also my family is here. So, you know, I came from the New York art world <laughs> and uh, I, I, I put on these different salons uh, to try and see what the art market is like in Detroit. And I quickly um, found, kind of like your journey, Jerry, uh, that Detroit is facing so many challenges. Me trying to sell contemporary art just seems ridiculous. And so my entire curatorial practice shifted. And that's when I start looking at how Afrofuturism, which is um, a way of looking at the black experience using speculative modalities like science fiction or fantasy, could be used to really um, imagine new futures for our city. But the theory wasn't enough. And so that is why I'm now working, I'm skipping a whole bunch because the time is over. But you know, after you teach children who are living without water, um, when you understand uh, the poverty, what poverty really looks like on the ground, uh, 
in the New York art world, no one cares about that. So here you're forced to deal with it because you see it every day as you're driving and as you're going to the, your grocery store, um, as you're going to the park, you, you cannot ignore it. And I like that challenge. I think all of us can agree that that challenge has probably made us grow and expand in ways that you cannot even imagine. Uh, and that's why it's so important that when people who want to work in Detroit live here first and connect with people first and really just be humble and learn. And that's what I had to do. And I'm from here. I was born and raised here. And I really had to take a step back and humble myself and really learn from people like Tawana Petty and other really beautiful activists about what it, what it means to be in the city. How do you properly contribute? And how do you learn and hopefully co-create with people? Like Jerry. Mm. Thank you um, for sharing. I I think for, for me, Detroit was happenstance. Uh, actually, coming to Detroit uh, was, was a confluence of, of a lot of factors, but I think staying here, staying here was not happenstance, right? Staying here was um, the, the result of an outsider coming into the city that I, I think saw um, a, a city that had an authenticity that I had not experienced in, in my own hometown, um, an authenticity that said, I'm going to welcome you here um, to be my neighbor, but I need you to acknowledge that like that our city has a collective sense of identity, has a history, has a culture, and I need you to honor that. And that what we heard that um, from from my neighbors, from students, from families. Um, and I think that that is what makes Detroit special um, is is a a sense of ownership uh, and of an identity that says, um, we welcome outsiders, outsiders like myself and like how I've been welcomed by my neighbors, um, um, but, but also a, a sense of identity that is, that is rooted in the city's history and the city's culture that says, um, we, we need you to honor that. Um, and I think having been in, invited into that um, was, was really important um, for, for me in, in, in a decision to stay and to, to, to make Detroit home um, is, is being welcomed into uh, what, what it means to be part of um, the, the, the city's identity and, and the city's culture and the city's history um, and, and to, to, be, um, to be alongside neighbors that, that are opening their homes and building community um, for longtime residents and for newcomers to be able to do that together. And, and, um, I, I think that that makes um, our city and, and our city's neighborhoods really special. Okay. So, um, Jerry, you know, when uh, my dad was talking about moving his business into the city, because we they were in Dearborn when they settled, everyone had the same, like, why would you go to Detroit? That's crazy. Like, well, you know, there's nothing there. It's not going to work. And you know, he's, he's been there for over 40 years and, you know, the Eastern market has certainly had a revitalization that um, we're now benefiting from, but it really takes that investment, that risk and, you know, people kind of really seeing Detroit for, for what it is and, and what it will be and can be as opposed to what it is right now in this very moment. And so I think everything uh, that everyone here said is, is really kind of speaks to that from, from your own personal perspectives. Um, so for, for our next question, um, you know, the, as, as you know, the title of this is Detroit is a hub for radical innovation. And, um, you know, we kind of got together prior to, to being here today to talk about what are some of the themes we wanted to highlight here. And, and one thing that we talked about is what radical and or innovation actually means, what it means to each of us. Um, and the discussion that ensued uh, really showed that there was no one definition. Uh, everyone kind of had their own perspectives about what that means. Um, and uh, I, uh, in grad school, I remember a professor once saying that um, innovation is just taking, stealing one person's ideas or one city's or one state's or one company's ideas and making it your own. And so, um, so to that end, um, kind of what about your work uh, in Detroit has been radical or innovative? Um, and uh, maybe even kind of what is it about this place or what is it about your work specifically that has fostered that, that type of thinking and environment? I, I can start. I, I think that the first thing that I've learned over um, 
kind of working in, in education, working in philanthropy in Detroit is innovation isn't always new. Um, and it's something that's been very humbling to, to realize that too. Innovation isn't always new because ideas that have worked in the city and in when we think about ideas that have worked in place in specific neighborhoods and specific contexts, a lot of them have already existed. Um, a lot of them have already existed, but sometimes um, when, when we think about innovation, sometimes we've um, kind of brought a philosophical approach to, well, I, I, I read this and therefore I think you should do this. Um, some, I, I, you know, funders have been guilty of that. Uh, but something I think we, we've learned is um, innovation has existed with blog club captains in the city, with longtime residents that have done work in their neighborhoods. And it's not, it might not be the, the, the shiny new object, but it's something that has worked for the last 50 years in our neighborhoods. And sometimes what innovation means is creating the space, creating the structures, providing the resources for the ideas that have existed, that longtime residents have led, um, for them to be amplified, for them to be elevated, and for that vision um, to be shared across the city, two different neighborhoods, two different block clubs. Um, and I think it's, it's a realization that sometimes metrics can't measure uh, innovation. We can't measure sometimes um, what it means to scale an idea that started at a block club that worked in a specific neighborhood, because sometimes measuring, trying to measure everything sometimes loses the humanity of the work we're trying to do um, and, and loses the narrative of place. And, and that was incredibly humbling, but also knowing that like, and thinking through, so what are then, are the innovations needed to create the structures and to create the space for the work that has already happened in the city to be elevated, to be elevated to institutions, to be elevated to funders, to be elevated to municipal government. Um, and, you know, at, at, at Kresge, something we're thinking through is we have funding initiatives. We have some, we have um, open calls, Kresge Innovative Projects Detroit, for example, is one where um, neighborhood level placemaking projects can be funded. But we also know that we have blind spots. We know that sometimes how we fund these programs are based on kind of our own definition of innovation. And so the question then is, how do we create the structures, right? How do we work with local capacity building intermediaries? How do we work with different partners to increase access for the block club captain that has done this work for 40 years and wants to share that work with the, with, with the neighborhood next door and say, we think we have a great idea that you might want to learn from to share from block club captain to block club captain that have maybe never gotten philanthropic funding before to do some of those projects. How do we build their capacity to be able to access funding, to, be, to build the structures necessary to say, you didn't get a grant this time. Let's actually talk through why that might be and provide you with the resources so that you can be more competitive next time. Because you might have never written a grant before, but I think philanthropy's role is to create the space um, for those innovations that might not be new that have existed for years to then be elevated across different sectors. And so that, that's, that's one thing, and, and um, I'll, I'll let others share more too. So I, you've got me thinking about how uh, dependent Detroit is on um, the foundations. And so my work is really about how do we uh, create our own um, pool of resources and, and financial, hopefully, um, kind of a stronger financial structure so that we don't always have to depend on foundations after reading De Decolonizing Wealth, um, I'm quite skeptical <laughs> of sometimes the agenda. And so we don't always wanna have to explain that to, to receive the funds to be able to do the thing that we do. So I have so many friends um, that inspire me, uh, like Onyx Ashanti, who does 3D printing and has a 3D printing lab, creates his own exoskeleton musical instrument. Uh, you can find him on TED, he's done a TED talk. But, you know, in this lab that is literally in an abandoned house um, <laughs> that used to be a trap house, uh, he has this, you could go in and learn about 3D printing at any point in time. For me, that's radical. 
he has he he accepts crypto, but he doesn't really you know into money, and so you know to be able to just say hey we're, there's a, um, another way uh, decentralized uh, production is really empowering for communities so that we don't have to depend on all these other sources. Government has already failed us. We're very clear on that. So you know what are the other ways that we can create resiliency in our own communities using hopefully other kinds of methods like tech. Uh, I ran for mayor of Detroit and it was inspired by the work that people are doing on the ground and seeing that uh, uh, Detroiters don't really know uh, that there are, number one, all these wonderful um, people who are working, maybe in, it feels almost like a silo, it's just that Detroit's so big. Um, but then also to know that there are other options for us to be able to grow. There are other ways, there's other structures. And so my platform could be considered somewhat uh, radical in the way that I was proposing universal basic income based off of uh, a cryptocurrency Detroit would create. Uh, as a result of proposing just that one thing, um, there are many other things of course, I've been able to really dive deeper into how to actually make those things happen, and I'm working to do that. So right now, EOC Trade is launching DAC Trade, which is a decentralized autonomous community, which is like a digital cooperative to hopefully support mesh networks that are going around in our city. Detroit, um, right now, 40% of Detroit does not have access to internet. So as we're talking about communication and growing and trying to um, foster initiatives and move towards the future, when 40% of our city does not have broadband access, you know, how do we make that, how is that possible? But at the exact same time, what complementary currencies can help support that and then hopefully support our local businesses and create an economy that is from the people empowered and led and completely co-designed by the people uh, and that that independence is what I'm trying to I'm striving for and that I've always been trying to look towards I am tired of asking for permission asking for money to do and create the thing that we know really works within our communities because we've already been doing it. And so that is the, I guess, radical work that I'm doing. Jerry. Your mayoral campaign was really cool. It's definitely look up Ingrid's platform. It was, it was a interesting complimentary package of, of things that she brought into that discussion. Um, so really quickly, I think I'm going to try to, to share kind of like a, arc of some of the things that I think we did, whether or not they were successful, that I think were innovative. They may have been accidentally innovative by being weird ideas sometimes. And then maybe bring into it kind of like my current sense of the, the mood of innovation in Detroit, because I'm actually, I, I don't want to say this in like a, a bad way, but just to be very honest, I feel like Detroit is not, as a, as a city and as a city government, not innovating anywhere near it could or should be, because we have a lot of problems that are going completely unaddressed and we're relying a lot just on money and development right now to try to to fix things which is not unhelpful when people are investing in your city but it leaves a lot of things out of the equation when you're not working on civic participation and thinking about things a little bit differently so um i don't know if this was innovative but it was definitely weird so maybe this is for the weird exchange uh conference uh, how we got started 2009 my two co-founders mary and larry and i knew we wanted to do something with putting land on the internet in some way. You know, so we had notions of like crowdfunding and social ownership and could you put properties in the city online and have people invest in them and, and work on them. So we launched kind of this ridiculous project where we bought a $500 vacant lot and we put a, a grid of square inch parcels on top of it. And people could go to a website, which is still up. It's internet.com, like the internet, but with, with inch. And you could inch vest in a square inch or multiple square inches of, of the land. Yeah, you remember. It was like, it was like who are these people? Um, and, and you could visit it in person or you could visit it online. And, and so it was kind of like crowdfunding. We were one of the first projects on Kickstarter. Fit. And a lot of the feedback we got was like, this is cute and weird. And I have no idea what you're trying to do. But could you do this kind of mapping like life size? You know, you've got these cool interactive maps. Could you take property information? about who owns everything in the city or what's at risk of foreclosure and build a map that people could go to and look that information up. And so we did, we kind of scaled from inches to citywide and that work got popular locally. And when Detroit went into bankruptcy, 2014, we were actually hired by uh, 
uh, white coalition, a task force that was supported by the White House and had a number of foundations. Kresge was a, a part of that and Dan Gilbert from Quicken Loans and basically tasked us like, can you hire Detroiters to go out to every single parcel of property in the city and, and identify current land use condition and, and occupancy? And so we actually helped manage that project and, and we did it. And it was kind of this, one of the first times that the lights kind of came on for, for what is the genetic code of Detroit's land use and vacancy look like right now in, in detail? And that really kicked open, I think, kind of the open data scene in the city to the extent that it exists right now. The city really invested in putting more information about its activities out on, onto a web portal. And But just, just to cap this right now, one of the things that's been very interesting there is we very much experienced this tension where sometimes the data doesn't say what you want it to say, and it becomes, um, depending on the story you want to tell, not necessarily advantageous to show people that even when you're tearing down thousands and thousands of homes, you're also foreclosing on people and more properties are becoming vacant. So we had to go through a lot of, we're still going through a lot of pressures on that where we toe the line between being advocates and activists on certain issues, as well as being a service um, provider. So Great. not to end it short, but that's, that's a basket of things that I think we've kind of gone through. And something I'm a little bit disappointed in the, in the city with right now is that we we're pushing this comeback narrative so hard that I think we're afraid to show some of the things that we still need to, to work on. And if it's like, if it can't be solved by uh, an investment or a development, then we don't know exactly what to, to do with it. It's a generalization, but I think it's an important one to, to bring up. Um, so I have one of the most difficult jobs of being the timekeeper because I, so I've become really, like, I forget the time going where it's going and I'm it. just so, as surprised when it goes off. So. Um, but, uh, so we, we do want to get into question and answer, but one last thing I want to touch on and, um, as, as, uh, so I'm a community organizer. That's kind of how I started my career. And I often say that you should never leave a room without having a call to action or, or something that you leave people with some sort of message or something to, to take back home. And so I'm going to leave it a little open-ended for, for you all. And what do you want that message to be to this audience? And um, whether it's what do you want them to leave in their understanding of Detroit, um, of the work that you all are, are doing, or what are some things they can take back to their own states and cities and organizations with? Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, to, Two quick things. I would say I think that a lot of people at this conference are, are mission-driven, mission-oriented people. Um, there's business people here, but a lot of people kind of have the mission component first. And I would say something that we've learned through our journey of getting our work funded and try to figure out how to sustainably grow a team, as we've done, is make sure that as you're pursuing your mission, try to build some sort of a business model that's not reliant on either big investors or reliant on foundations to sustain you. Because I found it's very easy to get sort of injections of, of resources to do work with. But if you can find a way to provide value to people to get paid so you can grow and not rely on granting and, or, or trying to get investment from somebody who might not ultimately like what your mission is, that's something that I think comes up in Detroit a lot that, I, that may resonate with some in the room. And I would just encourage people to, to run for, for office. I think one of the things that I've learned in the city is I wanted to totally kind of ignore what was going on with government because it's like, oh, we we'll just we can just come up with solutions and we can, but it is so powerful, even if it's a, a lower office or a, a neighborhood board, getting more people who wouldn't typically do that with the way that, the, with the kind of thoughts that are happening in this room, I think is really key in making things change. And so I would encourage people to, to run for office, even if it's a, a neighborhood level or, or, or a local level, it's very important to do. Awesome. Uh, because I, I guess I'm a curator and a very community oriented, one of the things I've been in the tech industry for about a year now, one of the things that, that, that doesn't seem to be talked enough about, I think the, the first panel on Friday touched upon it, um, I really want people to be more self-reflective. <laughs> I really want people to kind of dig into their own biases 
I really want them to start working on decolonizing their minds because you're creating the tech and it's infected by that and what how the tech acts is is it comes out, right? So we have that blatant example of the self-driving cars that don't detect darker skin. But there's a lot of nuances as actually that I'm starting to see at least within blockchain that some of the ideas and philosophies are coming through and how how it's being built or, or even discussed, the language around it, how it's introduced to people, and it's all coming from what's going on in our own minds. And without doing that self-check, um, you're just going to create more harm. And the very thing that we're talking about being radical and um, liberation and all of these things is actually BS at the end of the day because you're not actually trying to shift your consciousness and uh, how you um, interact with other humans um, and how you perceive other humans if you even see them as human at all. Um, so, you know, that is really, really really, really important. And so that is the thing that I take that to your tech companies and to your communities. Do the work of going inside. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Um, I, I think the one lesson, uh, biggest lesson from, De from Detroit that I, I might share is um, really thinking about when we're thinking about what's radical or what's innovative, thinking about that rooted in the context of place, and we said that a couple times, but really kind of what is, what is, the, what is the culture and the identity of the place you're working in and wherever you're from, wherever in the country or the world you're going back to, thinking about innovation in the context of what has already happened and honoring the work that, is, that has already happened in place. And I think, Ingrid, I, I don't disagree with you about um, building power of the social sector, whether it's nonprofits or, or community organizations who no longer have to um, rely on institutions that have traditionally held power. A lot of them are institutions that have disinvested in communities of color. A lot of them are institutions that have made it harder for um, certain communities to access, whether it's money, whether it's voice, whether it's, it's influence, um, and, and thinking about how power is built um, outside of traditional institutions, whether it's philanthropy, whether it's, it's, it's government, um, and how do we have community organizations that represent place, um, that, that have uh, power um, and have, have voice to, to be able to elevate um, what residents are saying. Um, and, and, and I think that, that um, if we're holding on to that piece of what innovation means in place, I think that um, can, can really be a, a sustainable um, kind of vision in the long term. So um, we have a little over five minutes for question and answer. If anyone wants to, I guess, come up to the mics and either pose it to a specific panelist or just a open-ended question for anyone to answer. Yeah, I just have a quick open-ended question about what specific problems are not being solved here. You had mentioned that investment isn't solving all the problems. And Ingrid, you mentioned, for example, 40% of the people here don't have broadband access. So I was wondering if there's other specific ex examples um, that we can hear today about problems that aren't being solved by the current paradigm. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, name a, I'll name a few uh, in that. <clears throat> Ones, everybody sees what they see. I look a lot at this land grid, so I see problems that come through that, but everything exists on land, so it's a pretty good way to think about the city, I think. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a poor city, first off, right? I think we have 40% poverty rate, I mean, it's, which is huge. You know, it's actually hard to get your mind around that that's real, that almost half the people in the city are living below the poverty threshold. Um, that, what that means effectively is that everything in life is hard to do. So it's, um, and, and that gets exacerbated when, it, when you have a state that has incredibly high car insurance, when your property taxes are incredibly high, when you've got deferred uh, maintenance on your house, so your house is dilapidated and you've, you're getting blight tickets you know, for, from the city. Um, and, and when we still have a system where our county seizes people's homes if they fall two years behind on the property, ta property taxes, you get your, your home sold in the third year. And I, what I've seen so far, and I want, I want to be fair about this, because I do think that there's a lot of things that have, have gotten better in the city from A, money, which is not very innovative, but which is important, right? I feel like when I talk to friends, it's actually 
in some ways I'm disappointed, but I want to ask myself why, where it's like, what changed in Detroit? What innovative things did you do to make the city better over the last five years? And it's like, there's just more money here. There just is. You can see as shops open up, there's more money. So what's happening is that things that money can solve are, are being solved right now. But what, but what we don't have is we don't have governments that are honest about their finances fully that won't let you know that they can't reduce your property taxes or help you pay on time because they like it when you pay late because then you pay 18% interest and in penalties and fees and, and fines on top of it. And so what I would like to see is a more um, a more open government that's, that's willing to talk about um, challenges that it's having, not in a superficial way, and to innovate itself, not only be a protectorate for inviting more money into the city. And I know I kind of went off base. That's not that's not a very clear list of things that's that's wrong. But it's but it's a it's a it's a poor city, and there's a lot of costs. It's 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 expensive to be poor, is another way to to put it too, right? Everything just just costs more, and we're really we're not addressing that piece. We're hoping that by in, investing in in new businesses and the landscape of the city and trying to create some more jobs in the city, which are very important things to do that somehow that's gonna come out to education, that's gonna come out of lifting people out of poverty, that's gonna make people more engaged. And I think it's an open-ended question right now, is that going to work or are we gonna have a conversation in five years in Detroit where it's like, yeah, ooh, you know, about that narrative, some good stuff happened, but boy, we need something else too now. Um, the next question. Thanks. Um, first of all, I just wanna say, Ingrid, I appreciate you so much for being in your situation. And I know that if I were in your position and in your skin, I would be screaming nonstop until they locked me up and threw away the key. And the fact that you are articulating your position so carefully and so calmly is incredible to me. And I just wanna echo what you are the only person on this stage who has consistently said throughout this panel, which is that this is about race. And if you ignore that, the money, none of it matters. And as somebody who is here for the first time in Detroit, and I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional. Um, I've never been here before. I'm here as a business traveler. I'm, I don't have the time or freedom to explore the city with the kind of purpose that I would love to. And so as I go out and I see just, I wanna go eat something, I wanna go get a drink, I see white owned businesses patronized by white people with white staff. And it makes my heart hurt because this is the city that people who come in from out of town are gonna see and I, this does not feel like a city right now that is being revitalized. It feels like a city that is being recolonized and I am disturbed. And I, I know that's not a question and I, I know that the investment, the companies that are coming in, that's important and I, it's, it's not a question, but I just, I'm, I've been here for three days and I'm bothered. And I just wanted to say that. But, thank you for those comments. And I do think it's an important issue that you've raised, and, and I do want the panelists, maybe Ingrid, to touch on it. But if we could just get the last question in, and then hopefully we could just kind of take the last couple minutes to respond. Yeah, real quick. God, thanks, everyone, for being here and do, um, doing this panel discussion. For those that are visiting or even in the audience here, and they're thinking, I want to help Detroit, I want to get involved somehow, what would you recommend? How would you recommend, recommend them getting involved or, quote, helping Detroit? Thank you. Ingrid, do you want to respond to the first? Uh, I think it's an important conversation. Yeah. So um, That was really beautiful and um, touching. Thank you. You made me a little emotional. <laughs> uh, wow, I don't even know where to begin with that, but it is it is true. I, I, have, <laughs> I do bring up race constantly because it seems like we're always afraid to talk about it. But if we're afraid to talk about it, then we're not going to, all we're going to do is cause more harm. And that's why I was saying that you have to talk about it even inside. I know, no one's a racist, I get it. But we have deep in our subconscious, like our culture, it's embedded in our culture and just be really real with that. It is embedded in the way the United States has been constructed from the very beginning. It has been, um, it's, the colonizing has never stopped. And uh, so I think that, uh, if we really want to move forward, we do have to be honest and, and, and really look at our world and really come to it in full force in all our complexity and to really unpack all of these different layers and see how that's affecting 
maybe you know you're not tackling race you want to tackle um universal basic income but because you're not tackling race people are going to be left out of this conversation okay and so what does that mean for your home for your community for your neighborhood like quite literally I've traveled to places where people, where the racial tension is so bad, there's walls that are 10 feet high trying to protect people um, in their homes. Do you want to live that way? No. And I hopefully don't think that we're going to get to that point. But Detroit is experiencing um, this influx of people who actually don't really want to connect or, or be around black and brown bodies, especially black bodies. There's a lot of fear around black bodies. And so, you know, my work is really, that's why I like Afrofuturism, to help break down that fear. But, you know, when we have this influx of people with money and all of these tech companies are coming and they're like, yay, we're coming to change and you have good hearts, but you can't look at me in the eye, you, your work is nothing. It's doing nothing. And so, you know... What I suggest is that not necessarily you grab a token black person and you sit them down and ask them a whole bunch of questions because that's traumatizing, so please don't do that. But look in within your community, especially if you're white, there are white people. There, we, we got some amazing white people in Detroit who are working really hard on racial justice. Jewish people who are creating co coalitions with black people, black and brown people here. I mean, it is amazing, yes. It is really, we are doing the work. It's not that we're not doing the work. We are very focused in trying to do it, but of course you can't catch everybody, right? Um, but definitely seek that out within your communities to figure out what's going on and how can we make this shift happen. As far as the restaurants go, you know, we're in Midtown and Downtown, so this is the most gentrified area that you're in. All conventions are always gonna happen here. We do have black owned restaurants, Savannah Blue, Le, Le Petit Zinc, Yum Village is a block away, um, but, we don't have enough for an 85% black city, right? It looks strange. I, I do understand that. Um, so think about what does that mean for your own city and as it's transitioning, because I know gentrification is happening across this nation. And what do you want to, how can you support businesses of color? And how can you uplift that so that we can have that beautiful diversity that we love here in our, in our, in our country? Um, but again, it all begins with decolonizing yourself. We are out of time, but maybe if we can have one minute, just, is that okay to have just one minute to answer the last question? Um, whoever. And I think the question is, what, what can people do to, to kind of give to Detroit to help kind of yeah. with its comeback revitalization so, existence, yeah. all of that? I watched Poverty Inc. yesterday and there's so many similarities between Detroit and the Global South and what the Global South experiences with NGOs and charities coming in and flooding the market and things. Um, one of the things that was said in the movie, and I've said it before, <laughs> you first just come and live here. Come and visit a lot if you can't live here and just be. That's number one, because you don't know how you're going to, I didn't know how I could help and I'm from here. <laughs> just sit with it and like understand the landscape. What do you really want to do? What is Detroit really like actually learn about our history and learn, please learn about our history. <laughs> I'm that full stop. And then learn about what's going on now and how that it's connected to the history. Uh, so often people are working here and don't have no clue about how we even got here or that, you know, all these beautiful neighborhoods were full of people and families. And that's how I grew up. Uh, there was no kind of devastation at all. So to always make this assumption, people come to me like, oh, you grew up here. Yes, I did. And it was great. And there were trees and it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> it was really, really wonderful. So, you know, just uh, like get take away all the assumptions and humble yourself and, and like just be here for a second. Thanks, Ingrid. I, I, I think my answer to that question is everything that Ingrid said, uh, but, but also just um, understand the, 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 the story and the narrative um, of, of, of this city that, that you're seeing over the last few days and also and, and, and not let um, not let I think the, the the sensational stories of like doom and gloom right like take over how you see um, and, and what you're seeing 
um, of, of this community. I, I think um, to what Ingrid said, come back, spend time here um, and, and get out of just downtown and midtown, spend time in neighborhoods and spend time with residents, go to church here and, um, you know, spend time understanding the identity of, of, of our city. Um, and, and because otherwise, what you understand of the identity of our city is shaped by people that might actually have only spent a few hours here and, but decided to write about it. Um, and, and so I, I think I would just echo Ingrid and, and say, come back, spend time here, understand um, what, what our city is all about, understand kind of the fuller history uh, of, of, of place. Take a quick, oh, we're out of time. <laughs> Maybe take a quick last yeah. few seconds. You know, just, just as two sentences, maybe three. Uh, if, if you're visiting and you have a car here or you can get a car, I really recommend just just drive around. Just drive around. We've got a pretty interesting system of the eight mile, seven mile, six mile, takes you across streets and then it's Spoke and Hub, you know, Woodworth and Grand River and Gashid and then Jefferson along the riverfront. Just drive a little bit, just use your eyes, open your mind. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to our panelists for sharing your stories. Thanks.